Carter Report presents worship from the Community Adventist Fellowship in Glendale, California. A special welcome to all of our viewers in North America and our new friends and churches in Russia. Today you'll enjoy uplifting music and the preaching of the everlasting gospel by pastor, teacher, and evangelist John Carter. Please get your Bible and study the Word of God with us today. Thank you for joining us for Worship and Praise. Last time we saw how God sometimes delivers his people from death, like the three worthies in the book of Daniel, but at other times he allows his followers to lose their lives. When I was younger and a new Christian, I wondered about this. There are texts in the Bible that say that God will protect and deliver his children. But what about people like Stephen and John the Baptist? Does God then contradict himself? Sometimes, humanly speaking, it looks like he does. But spiritually speaking, he does not. Remember, even though God delivered the three young men from the fire, what happened to them when they grew old? What happened to them? They died, didn't they? And so in reality, God didn't deliver them from the first death. He only postponed the event. And that's very important to remember. The Bible teaches that until Jesus comes, we will all die sooner or later. But then at the second coming, praise God, he will fulfill all his promises of all his children, and he will do this. He will deliver us together. And please turn with me to Hebrews 11, where it makes it very plain. Hebrews 11, verses 39 and 40. And it says, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. For God had planned something better. You know, often... Things happen. It doesn't look good to us. We want something better. But God has got something better. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. And this agrees with 1 Thessalonians 4. And as I saw this truth and I understood it better, it gave me a lot of peace and understanding and assurance. But now I had another problem. Why... Or how does God select the ones for whom he will postpone the event of death? And after much study and prayer, this was the conclusion I came to. I don't know. I will never know. That is God's prerogative. I must trust and bow to his sovereign will. And this trust, this faith, develops from three main facts. Number one... Faith develops as I communicate with God, as I read his word and I see how he led in the lives of other people. Number two, faith develops as I trust him in the little trials of everyday life. And number three, faith grows stronger every time I look at the cross and I see how much my God loves me. How much does he love me? Please turn with me to Isaiah 53. And I would like to encourage us to read this chapter at least once a week. For now we will just read the verses from 3 to 6. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. 
and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so every time I see my Saviour hanging on the cross, I know he loves me. And I believe that he will only plan what his sovereign will deems best for my life. And I pray that by his grace we will all be faithful so that in the words of Hebrews 11, we will receive the promise with them at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel 2 verse 1 says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, his mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. You notice it says here he could not sleep. It has been said that this man who could command mighty armies could not command one hour's sleep. He could command the whole world, but he couldn't command that he might go to sleep. Because the greatest of men are but men. And should animated mud be proud? Should animated mud be proud? Somebody has said that all we are, except for the grace of God, is animated mud on the way to dust. And here was the greatest king in the world who could command tremendous armies, but he could not sleep. Why should animated mud be proud? The greatest of men are but men. Therefore, we should not put our trust in men or human leaders. The Bible says, Cursed is the man who makes flesh his arm. We need to put our faith and our trust and our confidence in the everlasting God. Now, please read verse 2 and 3, which describes the brain trust. So the, because he couldn't sleep, the king summons the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Here we have the world's greatest intellectuals, and because of their tremendous desire to understand truth and understand wisdom, they had explored divination and magic and astrology as avenues to wisdom and the supernatural world. And so this book, the book of Daniel, also opens up a new world to us. It is the world of the unseen it is the world of the occult. And here are these great men in Babylon who are gazers at the stars, astronomers and also astrologers. They believe that the stars can influence human behavior. And our destiny is written in the stars. They are men who have tremendous power and they are in contact with occult forces. And they come in before the king and notice the confrontation between the two. Notice verses 4 and onwards. Would you please notice verse 4 and onwards. Then the astrologers answered the king. Look at verse 3. He said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me. I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. Why did they say that? Why did they say that? Why did they say to the king, tell us the dream? Why did they say that, Bob? They didn't know it, but if they did knew it, their human ingenuity would be sufficient for them to concoct a plausible explanation. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So read on. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. 
if you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Was this a reasonable request? Somewhat reasonable because these men claimed to be in contact with the gods. So read on. Once more, uh, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. Now, these verses tell us a number of truths. They tell us, firstly, my friend, the utter impotency of human wisdom. I am amazed that in this land of great enlightenment where people have a Christian tradition that astrologers are making such a tremendous impact. I'm amazed that the newspapers are filled with astrology charts. I'm amazed that people can think they can be Christians and practice astrology. You cannot believe in God and practice astrology. Astrology is a pagan science and it's under the curse of God. And it's very interesting to note here that the astrologers, when it came to the crunch, were powerless to deliver. I want you to notice something else too that these verses tell us, that man without grace is filled with tyranny, impetuosity, and cruelty. And this is Nebuchadnezzar. He is a man who is not a Christian man. He's not a believer in the true God at this stage. And because he doesn't get his own way, he is filled with impatience, tyranny, impetuosity, and cruelty. It's also apparent when you read these verses that either he's forgotten the dream, and I'm not sure if he has, but either he's forgotten the dream or he's not letting on. And there's something else too that we need to recognize from these verses. Two truths that the brain trust did not recognize or understand. They said, nobody can tell this dream except the gods. And the gods do not live with human beings. Of course, this is the essence of the religion of, of paganism, that the gods do not live with human beings. And so they said, nobody can tell the king this dream because the gods do not come and have relationships with human beings. And number two, they said, there's not a man on the earth who can read another man's mind. There's not a man on earth who can tell the king his dream. And they were wrong on both accounts. Paganism was wrong on both accounts because while paganism says the gods do not dwell with human beings, the greatest story in the Bible is how the great creator God, not the gods, not one of the gods, but the great eternal self-existent God actually became a man and lived among us. That's the great story of the Bible. And he has a name. His name is Jesus. The Bible said that the great God who made the whole universe actually came and dwelt in the womb of a little peasant girl and he was born into this world and he lived among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so they were wrong on this and they were wrong on another thing. They said, there is not a man on this earth who can tell the king his dream. They were wrong because they didn't know God's man. God had a man in the city of Babylon 
and God had his man in the right place at the right time to meet the emergency. Listen, I want you to know this. Listen carefully to this. You may think that everything in the world is out of control. I want to tell you this. God has always had his man or his woman in the right place with the word of God. God has always had his man. And very soon, they were going to discover that God had his man there, and that man was going to tell the king exactly the vision and the dream and what it all meant. Notice verses 12 and onwards. Verses 12 and onwards, dear hearts and gentle people. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So he becomes exasperated with them. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him how? Wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained this matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Now, let me read you a statement from the great commentator, Matthew Henry, one of my favorite commentators. The inspiration of some of the greatest preachers in the world has come from this man, Matthew Henry. Of these verses, he says, it is very common for those that will not be convinced by reason to be provoked and exasperated by it and to push on with fury what they cannot support with equity. This is the common reaction to a man who is not under the grace of God. Because he cannot get his own way, quickly he becomes hot and he issues a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be put to death. And because Daniel was recognized as being a superlatively wise man, the Bible tells us that when they decreed that all the wise men of Babylon should die, it was also decreed that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah would suffer the same fate as the frauds of the Babylonians. And so Daniel is now facing the death threat. But Daniel refuses to rant and rave over unreasonableness and the impetuosity of the king. It has been said that the saints must contend with unreasonable and wicked men. But we must do it through prudence and prayer. My friend Norm Matiko over there in, in Ukraine at present is dealing with little Nebuchadnezzars. He's dealing with men who are filled with their own self-importance. They're not going to hear this tape, I hope. <laughs> Else they'll get really mad, won't they? <laughs> but we do not win the victory with wicked and hasty-minded, unreasonable, wicked men, my friend, by becoming upset ourselves. Daniel said, I'm not going to fight them. Daniel said, I'm going to pray. And the best way to deal with a difficult situation is not by running and getting a lawyer necessarily, but it is by going into the courtroom of the Almighty God and getting down on your knees. And, and this, this is what he does. I want you to notice now, verses 17 and onwards. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matters to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, now let me tell you something. I'd imagine that was a meaningful prayer meeting. I imagine that there was no wooliness of petition. There was no usage of the old tried religious expressions that we're going to meet in the Sabbath school above and all the rest of that stuff. 
I'm sure that Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael knew what they had to pray about. And I'm sure that their prayers went up with the power of, of their own spirits and met with the Spirit of God coming down from above. And the Bible says that in response to the prayers of these four young men, God gave Daniel the same dream that he'd given to Nebuchadnezzar. Would you please notice it again? Verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Now please say it. And said, praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and opposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. How on earth did he know? Hey, you, did you think about that, Carol? How did he know? Now he had a vision, and he had a dream, and then he has a praise meeting, and he says, I want to thank you, God, because you have revealed to me the dream that the king had. But how did he know? Because... Up to this point, he has not spoken to King Nebuchadnezzar about the dream, has he? How does he know? He has faith, Bob and God. This is why, right? He knows God and he believes in God. He has faith in God. He knows that God in the universe is the one great dependable. He knows that God will never let you down. People may let you down, but God will never let you down. And so he praises God, and in the King James Version, it doesn't use the word praise. You know the word it uses? It says, he blesses God. Doesn't this seem a little unusual to you? In the King James Version, and this is a good translation, it says, after he received the vision, it says that Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Isn't God supposed to be the person who blesses me? But can I bless God? Hmm? Can I bless? How can I bless God? By faith and obedience. But this, in this chapter here, it tells us how we bless God. By praising God. And so when God answers his prayer, he blesses God. Did you know we have the capacity not only to receive blessing, but to give blessing? And every child of God is called to bless God and to praise God and to thank God that he's such a marvelous God. Listen. Too often we are begging God and asking God and trying to order God when we ought to be thanking God and praising God for his mercies to us. Don't you believe this? We ought to praise God. Now, this is on my mind, so please forgive me. Yesterday we had this funeral, Alicia's funeral. It is a hard time. For the loved ones. I don't minimize that. It is a hard time. The Bible says we sorrow. It was a hard time when I took my father's funeral. It was a hard time. But I'm glad today that I'm a Christian. I'm glad today when I take a funeral service, I can tell people that God is alive. You think of the poor Russians who for 70 years, Helen, never had the truth of the resurrection or the truth of God. Think of the poor lady who, whose whole village, whose whole town was buried alive by the Nazis down in the Ukraine. You know about that lady. We told you the story. Her whole village was buried alive. 
Only she and another young man escaped. They, they got out of the hole and they ran into the forest, but thousands of people were put down under the ground and bulldozers covered them up alive. Then she got on a train with this man and they traveled for days and they got off at Nizhny Novgorod. And there she lived for 50 years. She lived for 50 years and did not know that there was a God in heaven. And she said, I lived in despair. I thought I would, I would go down into my grave without any hope. She said, I had no hope. But then she said, you came to our town and I came to your meetings and I heard that there's a God in heaven who loves me and now I have everlasting life and I'm going to live again. And she said, all I want to do is thank God and praise God. When you know how good he is, my friend, you'll want to praise God and you'll want to thank God. And I want to say to the family who've lost a loved one, remember this. Our God is worthy to be praised because our Christ is alive and he's coming back again and the dead are going to wake up. I'm going to see my father again. He's not going to be an old man who had a stroke, but he's going to be a young man. He's going to be running down the streets of the New Jerusalem and shouting, Hallelujah. Hear this? The Bible tells us that Daniel praised God. And he blessed God. And if I could say this with reverence, I believe it when the church of God gets together and we praise God and we say, we love you God and we worship you and we thank you and we magnify your name and we, we revel in your plan of salvation. I think it makes God feel glad. I think it makes him sing for joy. If I could say this without being understood, I think it makes our Father feel warm in his soul that there are people who are blessing him down here on this earth. Now, would you please read on and notice the great dream. Daniel 2, we're going to notice verse 20, 24. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon, take me to the king and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah. I want you to notice the two men. Notice this man who's a pagan. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. I've done it, you see. I've done it. I've finally got you a man. Give me a pay rise. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Verse 27, Daniel replied, no wise man, no I can't, I can't do this. No wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. Now here are the words. If you got nothing from church today but these words, everything is bad, I know everything is bad, but there is a God in heaven, my friend. There it is. Mm -hmm. wise men are about to be put to death but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come your dream and the visions that pass through your bed as you lay on your bed are these listen to me my beloved friends when everything is looking bad for you when the world is falling apart when death comes into the family, when you've got teenage children and they're driving you up the wall and down the other side, when the bank is about to foreclose on your property, when everything seems bad, remember this, there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven. Our God, my friend, is alive. The God who lived in Daniel's time is just the same today. He's alive, you see. And when things are looking the blackest, it is the time when we should lift up our voices and we should bless God and praise Him who lives forever and ever because He is the living God.
He's not a dead God, my friend. We don't serve a puny little tin God. We don't serve a little impotent God. We don't serve some something nothing. But we serve the mighty God who made the universe and who made the stars and he is with us. There is a God in heaven and this God hears the prayers of his people and he is in charge of the universe. Mm. Boy, that's good, isn't it? Boy, I'm going to feel good after preaching this sermon. Felt tired when I started, but I'm starting to get my adrenaline starting to flow, folks. It starts after a while, you know. You just have to give me enough time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, start of verse 29. Stayed with, at Carol's place last night, and she gave me some bananas for breakfast, and that usually starts to hit me about this time. Sugar starts to come on. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries, who is that? God. The revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. Here is a genuine prophecy. As for me, the mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may know what went through your mind. And so he is giving glory to God. I want to say this to you today. I believe there's no limit what God will do for a person if that person will give the glory in the right place. When we start giving glory to ourselves and taking credit for baptisms and for people coming to Christ, then God is going to take the wheels off the chariot. Every good thing that any of us has ever done has been done by the grace of our Father in heaven. And so he says, I'm not going to tell you this dream because I'm smarter than the brain trust. I'm not going to tell you this dream because I'm smarter than the Chaldeans and the astrologers and, and all of those people. He said, I'm going to tell you this dream because there is a God in heaven and this God is almighty and this God wants you to know what's going to happen. So give God the glory. If you ever do anything and you think it's, it's helped the work of God, say, glory be to God. God has made it all possible. Now please read on. And now we're going to read the dream of dreams. Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 31. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, Awesome in appearance, the head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you now. This is it's very important. Those words comprise around 200 words. The dream, the whole dream, it's about 200 words, the whole lot here. But we have 200 words that tell the history of the world. I will suggest to you that after we have gone through the rest of the vision, that here we have remarkable evidence why a person can believe in God. Let me tell you a story. It's the story of Prince Zemir, who became the king of Persia. After his father's death and he became the king, he sought for the guiding history of, of the world. He wanted to 
get a group of scholars together and that they would study for him the great acts of the past so that he would become a wise ruler. And so he sought with great intensity for a guiding history of the world, the past. So he assembled the greatest scholars of his day. This is a great story. He said, I want you to write me the history of the world. I want it to be plain and simple because I'm going to rule the world according to the lessons I can learn from the past. Twenty years later, the scholars came to see him leading a caravan of twelve camels. Each camel was carrying a burden of five hundred volumes, making a total of six thousand large books. The king was then middle-aged and he was very, very busy with governing the great land of Persia. And he said, I'm so busy, I don't have time to read six thousand books. He said, I appreciate what you've done, but I will not have time. Then he said the words, abridge it, condense it, abridge it, and bring me back the wisdom of history. Twenty years later, the same committee appeared, leading three camels. Each camel contained 500 large volumes, 1,500 books. Prince Samir said, look, I am now an old man. I am still very busy with governing. He said, I do not have time to read even 1,500 bo uh, books. He said, abridge it, and with much expediency, abridge it. And so they left. Ten years later, a smaller committee appeared, leading a small elephant that carried 500 volumes. The secretary, now an old man, stood up and he said, Your Majesty, here are the 500 volumes that give the history of the world. He said, We have been exceedingly brief said the king, but not brief enough. He said, I do not have many more years. Abridge it and abridge it with much urgency. Quickly give me the history. Five years later, this is true, the secretary of the committee, the committee was dead, only the secretary survived, and he came on crutches leading a small ass that carried one large book, and the king was breathing his last. A Bridget, a Bridget, and here the God of heaven has abridged it into 200 words with a greater accuracy than all the thousands of volumes that have been written in the history of the human race. And here in these words, the words of the great metal man and what they mean, we have God's great outline of the history of the world. Great metal man, awesome in appearance, with a head of gold and a chest of silver, and belly and thighs of bronze, and legs of iron, and feet part of iron and part of clay. And then I love this part because the metals have been worked by human ingenuity. But then a stone is cut out of a mountain. That is very significant, as we will discover. The stone is cut out of the mountain without hands. Glory be to God. Cut out of the mountain without hands, and the stone flies through the air, and it strikes into the image. And the image is pulverized into a billion pieces. And then the stone grows and grows and grows and becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. 200 words. God has abridged it. Notice it. Notice what it means. Verse 36 to 45. And here you'll have the finger of God, as the Egyptians would say. Verse 36, this was the dream. Now we will interpret it to the king. What do you think the king was doing now? Mm. The king was sitting on the, the, the very edge of the throne. 
because he is saying, this is more than humanity. This is the voice of God. Who can dream the dreams of another man? He's saying, this is the voice of God. This is the evidence that this is God's man. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. Who is the true king of kings? Mm. But he was the counterfeit. Did you get that? Babylon is the great counterfeit of the kingdom of God. Why is it the head of gold? Because gold is the most illustrious of minerals. When we have an evangelistic meeting, we cannot go into all these details. But in the kingdom of Babylon, in the great temples of their chief gods, you had gold and gold, run and more gold. And the temples were overlaid with gold to shine like the sun. The city of Babylon was seated upon a great river. It flowed right through the bosom of the city. And they had avenues of trees and ornate gardens. And they had a government where the king was called the king of kings. And everybody knelt before him. What does it sound like? It sounds like the kingdom of God. Because in paradise there is going to be the river of life and the trees and the avenues and there is going to be a king over them. An absolute monarchy is going to come to the world. That is the kingdom of God. But this is the counterfeit of the kingdom of God. And the head rules the rest of the body. And Babylon was to rule the rest of the world and does so today. Babylon is still ruling. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hand he has placed mankind and the birds of the field and the birds, the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever you live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. Carol, what is the head of gold? Babylon, represented by this great potentate, Nebuchadnezzar. And so the head of gold on the great metal man represents the great kingdom of Babylon that ruled the world from 605 down to 538 BC. Verse 39, after you, another kingdom inferior to you will arise. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Now what power was this? This is Rome. And the chest of silver, what was the chest of silver? What was the kingdom that came after Babylon? It was the kingdom of Medo-Persia. And after Medo-Persia came the kingdom of the thighs. What was that? It was the kingdom of Greece under Alexander the Great. And then the Bible says there would be a fourth world empire. Now, some will say to me before we go any further, what about China and Africa and other nations in the world? Why are they not mentioned? Number one, this is not an encyclopedia of history. God is dealing with... Listen carefully, this is important. God is dealing with the nations that had a direct influence upon the people of God. And Babylon, and as far as God is concerned, those other great empires are irrelevant as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. Babylon held in its embrace Israel. So did Medo-Persia, so did Greece, and so did Rome. That was where the people of God, the people of the covenant were. And that is why the dream is around Israel. And then when Israel was, was turned from God, when they turned from God, you have the church, the church of the living God, and it came under the, the power of the fourth world empire, the empire of Rome, which was to spread out and to take in the kingdoms of the world. This is the reason why. We are dealing here with God's interpretation of history. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, verse 40. That's the iron monarchy of Rome. For iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush 
and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, or the kingdom will be divided. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Listen very carefully. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then you have the division of the Roman Empire into the kingdoms and the states of Europe. And in a very real sense, the Bible teaches we are still living in the fourth monarchy. And it is very interesting, listen carefully because I've got so much to tell you in a few moments. In the book of Revelation, the last great empire that rules the world is called, do you know what it's called? It's called Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And even the last empire, which is Rome, as it goes into all the world and breaks up, it is called Babylon Because the Bible says that this world is the kingdoms of this world are not the kingdoms of God, but they are the kingdoms of Babylon, the great counterfeit system. That is why, my friend, and don't misunderstand me, I am not a nationalist. I believe in loyalty to one's government, but first and foremost, I believe in loyalty to the government of God. And that is why I do not have a great regard for the view that would set one nation above another nation and one nation saying, but we are the chosen people. There is no nation today which is the chosen people of God. God has got his people in every nation under heaven. Whether they are Americans, Australians, British or Spanish or black or white or yellow or brown, it is not what their nationality is, it is where their allegiance is found. And so you come down to the fourth, and then you come to the toes. And Bible prophecy teaches that we are not living in the head or the chest or the belly or the legs, but we are living in the toes of time. It talks about how they would mingle themselves with the seed of men, and this is an apt description of how the kings of Europe have done everything in their power to set up a fifth world empire. But the Bible says there will never be a fifth world empire of human origin, but there will be a fifth world empire. The Bible says they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not cleave one to another. There will never be unity in this world again until Jesus comes. Listen to me. You know why you can't have unity? You can't have unity in this world until people acknowledge the God of heaven. You want to know why different nations in this world hate each other? You want to know why people here in Los Angeles hate each other over their different racial background and over the color of their skin and why we've got a war going on in Los Angeles which is nationalistically and racially based? Would you like to know why? It is because people are outside the kingdom of God and they do not acknowledge that Christ is Lord of all and that every person in Christ is Every person is his brother or his sister. And people will never love each other and get along until they acknowledge the sovereignty of Christ. They'll mingle themselves with the seed of men. They'll never stick together. Alan White said concerning this, and it's an interesting statement, the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. And what happened back there, of course, after the days of the Roman Empire, the iron and the clay mingled together, different peoples mingling together, church and state joined together to bring about a fifth world empire. Even Hitler tried to bring about a fifth world empire. The communists tried to bring about a fifth world empire. But the Bible says it'll never, never happen until the prince comes to whom it is due. Verse 44 Verse 44, and this is where I believe we are living, dear hearts. 
In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. And if your heart is in those kingdoms, it will bring you to an end too. But it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy and certain. Let me give you quickly just a little theology. What does the stone represent? The kingdom of God. But more than the kingdom of God, the stone represents Jesus. The Hebrews are two words they used to play with, play with. Ben Eban. Ben Eban. What does Ben mean? It means son. What does Eban mean? It means a stone. In Daniel chapter 7, you have the parallel passage to the coming of the stone. And in Daniel chapter 7, it says, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Jesus said, whoever falls on this rock will be broken to pieces. But upon whom this rock falls, it will grind him to pieces. Jesus is the cornerstone. The Babylonians and the ancients believed that the gods lived in a mountain. And they had stones that they called navel stones. This is all new to you. They had navel stones. And they believed that the navel stone represented the great kingdom of the gods. And here God in this prophecy is talking the language of the ancient Babylonians. He said a stone which represents the sun. Ben Eban. The sun is going to be cut out of the mountain out of, without hands, without human hands. And he's going to come and his kingdom is going to strike the earth. And he's, it's going to pulverize it to pieces. And then that kingdom, which came spiritually when Jesus came to this earth, that kingdom is going to be consummated when Jesus comes with the angels of heaven. And when he comes the second time, he is going to strike this earth and the kingdoms of this earth are going to be destroyed. And his kingdom is going to grow and grow and fill the earth. Verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor, didn't worship him, ordered that an offering and an incense be presented to him. In what way? Why did Daniel accept this? They brought an offering to Daniel. The king of Babylon brought an offering to Daniel and bowed before his feet. You know why? Because here we have the promise of the triumph of the kingdom of God. The king of Babylon bows before the servant of God who represents the kingdom of God. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while, Babylon himself, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. What does it all mean? Let me give you a summary. Number one, our times are in his hand and he controls revolutions great and small which affect even the least of his children. Number two, the stone is coming. It is going to be cataclysmic. It is going to destroy the world and the kingdom of God is going to be set up on the rubble and you can be part of the kingdom of God. The stone is coming. There is a way of escape I said to you before, nobody automatically gets to heaven. Nobody here is going to go to heaven because you've got your name on the church roll. Nobody here is going to get to heaven just because you go to church. We get to heaven because we come to Christ and accept Him as our Lord and our Savior. 
We need to believe in him and acknowledge him and bow before him and crown him King of kings and Lord of lords. We need to fall upon the rock and be broken. If we don't fall upon this rock and get broken, the rock is going to fall upon us, Jesus said, and it's going to grind us to pieces. And so we need to fall upon the rock and be broken. And one theologian has made this statement. I want to read it to you because it's great. He who falls upon the stone has his self-will broken. But from the shattered casket there shines a light which will glow to eternity because lit from heaven's altar's flame. If you fall upon the rock and if you're broken, when the casket of this life is shattered as I give myself to Christ and self is shattered, from the casket there shines a light that will shine to all eternity because lit from heaven's altars. I want to ask you today, fall upon the rock. Accept him as Lord and Savior of your life. Do it today. The stone is coming. As you sit here, just listen. Think of the things that are happening in the world and listen. I can hear the stone coming. Can you hear the stone? It's coming. Get ready. The stone is coming. Amen.